Yep, I caught one of those flus that's been going around. So y'all gonna have to bear with me if I sound a little nasally. And then the other thing is I wanted to let all my listeners know that we are, I am, this podcast is going back to the same original questions we had at the beginning. It was some, uh, you know, I was just trying to figure things out because some of the passion was shifting. And I realized it had become more about trying to have a conversation than what this podcast was originally intended to be, which was me listening to my brothers, our brothers. And I also found the questions that I asked at the beginning, while some of the answers you guys noticed, they did repeat, you started to hear some themes, but that's kind of the point. So with that. Welcome to 365 Brothers, the podcast. I'm your host, Robin Shine. I am delighted to bring to you brothers from across the United States and from various professions talking about their life experiences, their wisdom, and a conversation that also touches on racial profiling in the United States, how pervasive it is, what the impact is. And remember, you can follow us on Instagram at 365 Brothers. Also, follow us on Facebook at 365 Brothers, the podcast. If this is your first time listening to a 365 Brothers episode, make sure you subscribe because you do not want to miss one brother's wisdom, one brother's experience, and their perspective on life in the United States. Today, we have the privilege of speaking to a young man, um, young to me. (laughs) He is a third year medical student. And, um, you know, when they go through this process of, you know, trying out different things, they can end up anywhere. But a couple of the ones he's thinking about is family practice and psychiatry. But he has always had a commitment to improving healthcare and addressing disparities in health. Perhaps this has been augmented by his attendance at Oakwood University, which is one of our HBCUs here in the United States. Wearing his Oakwood shirt representing Oakwood University, don't doubt it. (laughs) Now, he's also well-traveled. He's visited over 15 countries on five continents. The other thing I want to say about him is, um, yeah, he's handsome, y'all. Yeah, he was Mr. Oakwood. And it's easy for me to say that he's handsome because he's also a different relative of mine. (laughs) (laughs) It just kind of runs in the family. (laughs) Oh, goodness. (laughs) (laughs) And he enjoys spoken word poetry and occasionally binging Netflix series. So I totally got that in common with you, my bro. We are now going to be having our conversation today with Joseph Smith. Welcome, Joseph. It's so good to be here, and uh, I'm glad to just share my experience. Before we go into the official questions, Joseph, is there anything that you'd like to share with the listeners before we get started? I think, and this is the thing that will probably come up through a lot of my answers, my journey in growing and learning and developing has has definitely included a lot of like self-doubt and second-guessing myself. I think a lot of what I'm learning and discovering about myself in this time right now is is combating that or like rewriting those stories in my head of what it means to be a black man, of what it means to be a man who's influential in society, who makes an impact. And yeah, that's that's kind of like a lot that I'm learning. And I think that's important for a lot of us to understand and allowing us as, as Black men to kind of open that dialogue of, of what that looks like and um, share stories because it really helps. Um, yeah, it helps when I hear other people rewrite that narrative for themselves. It helps me understand how I can rewrite that narrative. I love how you said it because that's really beautiful. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful how you said that because that's really what it is for me to record these stories and make them available. Joseph is going to be the 131st brother interviewed and the beginning of our episodic numbering. And this is Martin Luther King Day. And one of the things I love about what you're saying, Joseph, is it's easy to look at our established heroes, our new and contemporary heroes. But I love hearing about the day to day heroes like you becoming a doctor, you working to minimize these disparities in healthcare, that's heroic. 
to redefine all the different ways that black men are heroic. Mm-hmm. Let's let's get let's get that in. Let's 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 just do that. <laughs> so thank yeah. you. Well, with that, let's jump in. My first question is: What is a favorite song or movie? I did one of each. Yeah. Okay. All right. See, I'm gonna let you. I'm gonna let you do that. Cause your family. You know? <laughs> uh, let's start with what's your favorite song? Spotify at the end of the year kind of lets you know what your top hundred songs were for the oh, year. Oh yeah. And one of my songs for this year is called "Beautiful Life." by uh nao yeah not a super well-known song but she just has this line in there that really was like the theme of (laughs) this year for me and kind of the past couple years that talks about you know here's a moment just to think about like all that is you take a moment just to breathe it out until it feels good it's like wow there's so much that goes on on a day-to-day basis we're all busy we all have things that we're stressed about Um, But that song just does such a beautiful job of like, yo, like chill. Think about all that you are, like all that you've accomplished in the past. Take a moment to sit in that. Take a moment just to breathe and feel like how good that feels just to breathe and be thankful for that and sit in that moment. And so, yeah, there were many afternoons, evenings. I was in the process of studying for my first set of boards this year. And, you know, you just you study till your mind is numb till you can't (laughs) look at the screen no more. And, uh, yeah, I would take walks in the in the neighborhood and just have that song on the repeat. Just listen, whatever happens from here on, like, look at who you are right now. Look at what you've accomplished. Breathe until it feels good. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to have to look that song up myself. That sounds so affirming and chill at the same time Mm -hmm. very cool what about your favorite movie i hate to say this because i feel like it's very stereotypical but um it's got to be black panther yeah that movie ain't no problem with that truly Truly. yeah i I just watched the second one a couple weeks ago um and yeah the first one just when it came out and just this reimagining of what what Africa could have been if it weren't for colonization and just style and the dialects and the language and even just how they portrayed the diaspora. Like I just, it was everything I needed it to be. It was everything I needed it to be. Mm. And it really paralleled my life as well. Having, that was my second year at, at an HBCU and just like seeing the parallels from being in Wakanda to being at an HBCU and just, yeah, no, it was, it was amazing. So your high school experience, how was your attendance at HBCU a contrast for you to high school? Oh, whew. well, let's get into it then. Uh, yes. <laughs> it was a huge contrast for me my parents always laugh when the show blackish came out they're like this show is about you uh, i uh went through a small private school basically k through 12 and where was this i'm from denver colorado originally so already a very non-diverse <laughs> area Got you. Um, and then you know you go within a private school in in the suburbs and so that really yeah I want to say I was one of maybe two or three black people in my class my whole way through and so yeah that experience just always being of the mindset you you are the black kid that is your identity (laughs) and walking in that it was it was beneficial and it was challenging. Challenging, of course, with all of the microaggressions and always walking on eggshells, knowing that I can't do what my friends are doing, that I can't act like my friends are acting, knowing that I always have to do twice as good to get half half of uh, what other people can get. So that was a mindset that I always lived with. And with that mindset, it propelled me to be like, bet, I'm going to show y'all. <laughs> I know in your mindset, there is what Black is, what Black can do, what Black can't do, what Black looks like. And I took it as a challenge. I'm going to be everything y'all think that I can't be. I'm going to be everything that y'all, I, you know, I wanted to be the example of, of, of all that Black can be that, that society says it can't. And Mm -hmm. so, yeah, that really propelled me to, I I served as 
class president from eighth grade all the way through senior year. First black male class president. My school is over 100 years old. Um, what? Graduated as valedictorian, the first black valedictorian at my school. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah, you know, that it was a challenging environment to be in, yeah. but it really it challenged me to be like, OK, this is this is the role that I need to fulfill. Um, okay. And so coming to an HBCU was amazing for me. It was a culture shock, of course. And I think one of the biggest pieces of that was the identity that I had being just black like that. Mm. That is your identity. You are the black kid. Um, and coming to a place where you, okay, you're black, but like everyone, <laughs> what are you now? Like, right, right, you know, right. Who are you within that space? What do you enjoy? And so that was something that was challenging for me. You know, if you are a minority in a space that's predominantly white, the expectations generally are pretty low for you, you know, <laughs> like they yes. don't. Yes. And so anything that you do that is good or, or you know, somewhat good you're praised for it. You know, wow, you know, you really did. (laughs) That was amazing. Or, you know, I loved how you and how you talk talk (laughs) to professional. (laughs) You can really do the bare minimum and get praised. Right. You're, you know, the only one. And so coming into an HBCU, you know, and the things that I had done in childhood and my academics, it was like, you know, there's a hundred of you. There's a thousand of you on this campus. You know, you don't get (laughs) <laughs> special props for how you talk or you know for being uh, a straight valedictorian even I'm sure yeah, you know uh, there, there were 10 of them in my class in biology right. Like, right so it really really challenged like okay there's a new threshold for what excellence looks like and that was it was so good for me it was so good for me it hurt in the moment because it's like wow you know I'm not I'm definitely not all that I thought I was, not everything that everybody back home told me I was. Um, Mm -hmm. So where do we go now? (laughs) Mm -hmm. Where do we go now? Um, But yeah, it was such an enriching experience just to see iron sharpens iron. Iron truly sharpens iron. And you get a ceiling effect kind of when you are the only Black excellence that you see. Um, But just to go and see the music that we're able to create the the way that we speak the way that we perform it elevated what i thought was possible to something that i i, I never would have been able to accomplish if i had just in white spaces there's a mouthful one of the the things that i think i would have certainly enjoyed had i chosen an hbcu and it just wasn't on my register back then the opportunity to see Black excellence in so many fields and in so many colors and in so many, just the variety of it and the commonness of it. Mm-hmm. You know, like there are not a lot of places where you can have that Wakanda esque experience of being surrounded by and unimpressed by. Black access, and I don't mean unimpressed in a belittling way. I mean unimpressed in the way you talked about it, where, yeah, this is just a standard. Like, we we all get stuff done. That's what we do. (laughs) That's what we do. And and the contrast to that is the heaviness of low expectations. Yes. Go ahead. Finish it for me, because I got got that you got me. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, just this you are shooting to meet an expectation and that continually wanting to do that. Yeah. And I think I kind of, I lost myself in that a little bit. That's my point. Yes. Yeah. And I think a lot of us do, and we don't even know it. So anyway, we go on on that. So, but I love that that came out in what you shared. So getting on to this next question, what is the favorite moment from your childhood? Oh, my parents, <laughs> they are, they're a good time. I think uh, a lot of my friends are always surprised when I'm like giddy to go home for break or like I can't hang out because I'm hanging with my parents. Like, bro, who who does that? But one of our big things in childhood was 4th of July. My parents are both pyromaniacs. And that was like the one time a year that you could blow <laughs> stuff up and not be put on like a no fly list. And so I remember as a kid, uh-huh. 
just like leading up to fourth of july we'd be because fireworks were banned in in denver where i grew up so we would drive out of state to other states where it was legal to get like the big stuff like the finales that would blow Ooh. the air. oh my would buy m80s like quarter sticks of dynamite like <laughs> just <laughs> okay pyromaniacs i heard you <laughs> like we do that and um yeah just remembering as a kid like the thrill of my dad you know okay come on here here's the lighter you know i'm gonna hold your hand while you light this and then we're all running hightailing away from it and <laughs> just you know it was it was it was crazy it was crazy you know looking back on it there's so many times i could have blown my hand off i was just i was just thinking you know i'm glad you're still yes. here <laughs> it was dangerous and i don't think i would do that for my kids definitely but the fact that i got to experience it i'm grateful right. for and now do you have siblings i do have siblings yeah older so. younger one two three what do you think i am what do you think i am in the mix oldest i'm the youngest i can kind of see it i can see it in the demeanor you know what i'm saying <laughs> but that achievement threw me off because i'm like that's you your achievement level is such a first child level so youngest of how many youngest of five and it's kind of deceiving to say that i'm the youngest youngest of five i have four older siblings but it's a 13 year gap between i knew it see I, I should have said that before you put yeah. it in you know I'm <laughs> say? no because you're you're reliving top dog and so that 13 you don't even count you, you yeah you like oldest number of the second set that was just one <laughs> Exactly. Because they they started having kids, my siblings, when I was five. So I'm like the oldest of their kids. OK, and I was also the only for a little bit. So it's yeah, OK, youngest, but only but middle, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the only reason I asked was because I was getting this vision of a whole group of people. Like it didn't sound like that experience would just be you, your mom and your dad. Oh, you know? yeah. no, it was my siblings. It was cousins that would come over. It was all the neighbor kids. It, oh, wow. It was an event. It was an event. <laughs> that sounds awesome. Oh, my God. That sounds like fun yeah. and dangerous, but a lot of fun. <laughs> a lot of fun. I wouldn't do it for my kids, but I it's an experience that I'm thankful for. <laughs> That's excellent. Uh, well, let's talk about accomplishments. As I said, your accomplishment level had me taken you to to first child. but. I asked this question is very specific to accomplishments. The first one, the one that means the most to you personally. And then secondly, the one that tends to get the mm, or wow from others. So let's start with that first one. Which of your accomplishments is the one that means the most to you personally, Joseph? Yeah, I think public speaking is something that's very big in our family. On both sides, my grandfathers were pastors. And so mm. oration and presenting and speaking was something that from an early age, my parents were like, you know, at church, you're going to get up there. <laughs> you're going to get up mm. there. Offertory, you're going, you know, for children's story. Started preaching when mm. I was 10 years old, competing um, wow. in competitions to do orations. And so I think early on, it was like, you know, Speaking is something that I'm going to do. My parents have kind of forced that on me. And I felt very insecure early on um, with some of the things that I would present. Cause it's like, you know, my mom helped me write this. Like, you know, I can get up there and say it, but I can't really like live in that. That like, you oh, know, yeah. this is something that I wrote or something that really came from my heart. And so as I've grown up, I've gotten a lot more into writing and there's nothing like really getting up there in front of a group of people and getting to share a piece of your story or getting to share a perspective that you have that through and through like from the words that are in it to the thought process behind it to the way that it was presented to the hand gestures that you use it tells such a story and so i think truly those speaking engagements i i won a a national oratory competition sponsored by barry black the U.S. I think he's still the U.S. chaplain, United States chaplain. Um, okay. So I won an oratorical contest with him, and then me, Mr. Oakwood, the pageant at my HBCU. I performed for my talent was a um, an oratorical speech that I gave, and I think that was a huge piece of of how I won. But yeah, I think in the in the midst of things that I've accomplished, those are things that I look back at, and I'm like, yeah, like no, I really through and through like that. 
was something that my whole heart was in from the beginning of every word that was placed into that, into the delivery. Mm. I love it. I love the full spectrum of creativity that you appreciate and enjoy, that you allow creativity to influence the whole thing. It's not just, I wrote the words, now I'm a Sam. What's the accomplishment that when others hear it, it's the one that's most likely to get the, ah, oh, or wow? Yeah, I think the two biggest ones. During undergrad, I did a research internship at Harvard, Harvard Med School. And so I was there for several weeks and did some research, presented it. It was on neurobiology. Um, yes, just the name, like Harvard. People are like, you, you went to Harvard? Yeah, you're right. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, my God, neurobiology. Wow. <laughs> whoa, whoa. It's like, you know, it sounds yeah. cool, but that's not, you know, what I actually did there. It's something that was cool. It was a great opportunity. I wouldn't say it's my favorite accomplishment of mine. Um, right. And then also getting into med school, um, I was accepted here at Loma Linda um, and I got a full ride for med school. Um, hey. And so that is also something that people hear and it's like, wow, <laughs> wow. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, you see, I got a, hey. <laughs> full ride for professional full for those who don't know i mean shoot we, we we're happy if you get a full ride for undergrad getting a full ride mm -hmm. post undergrad for graduate study it happens it's not that it doesn't happen but it only happens to some and you know the best really and then to get that for medical school oh no that's not an everyday thing that is not an everyday thing oh yeah congratulations thank you thank you yeah that's you yeah, no, <laughs> And there it goes. <laughs> there it goes. Right. <laughs> um, that's great. And so I think that's um, something that I'm I'm more thankful for and humbled about mm -hmm. than I am necessarily proud about. Like, oh, you know, I really like no, that's that is a blessing that was bestowed upon me. Mm -hmm. That's not something that I feel like I earned or that I did more than other people did to Got you. Do that. I do appreciate the context in which you hold that achievement you know it is an achievement but i also get anyway yeah I, I hear you and and you're right that is most undoubtedly a blessing because <laughs> mm -hmm. what what is that going for now a med school education a couple hundred thousand yeah yeah for the whole four years it's over two hundred and fifty thousand dollars yeah y'all hear that when you go to the doctor, especially any new doctors, I'm talking about the old ones who were on, you know, 1970s money or 1980s money. They, you know, they took on a quarter million dollars worth of education, whether they paid for it or was paid for by their parents or they got a full scholarship. Either way, I'm not saying you got to believe everything your doctor says, because heaven knows I don't. But at least listen. <laughs> at least listen. <laughs> It is a commitment. It is right? truly. And we, we talk about that often to be in this space now, you know, third and fourth year is, is really, all, it's training, but it's almost free labor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and to think mm -hmm. that it's almost, you know, it's like worse than free labor because you're paying. Right. Labor. And so, yeah, no, I definitely, I think it's, it's more of a sacrifice than, than people often like to realize. Yeah. Yeah. And people will tell you, you know, people tell you going in, if you are going into this to make money, there are so many better ways. There, <laughs> there are so many quicker ways. There are ways where there's less expectations of you. And so truly, yeah, no, you have to, you have to go into this with some level of, of passion to, to really withstand and do this well. Mm, mm. Now, since I know about your love of oration and your skill, I'm going to ask you about your favorite quote, saying, metaphor, or book. Oh, but if it's anything other than a book, I want to hear it delivered. <laughs> oh, goodness. Wow. And, you know, I, I think I might disappoint on this one. Uh -oh, I think I might uh -oh. disappoint. I, I would love to say that I have an artsy, like, quote or metaphor. I think one of the kind of mantras that I live by, or not mantra, it's a, it's a verse, Isaiah 55, 11, just talking about God, prefaces by saying, you know, your thoughts are not my thoughts, 
your ways are not my ways. You know, my ways are higher than yours are, just as the sky is above the earth. And he says, for as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return there, but they water the earth and bring it forth to bud and give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth. It shall not return to me void. Um, that, you know, I preface that I often yeah. feel so insecure in the space yes. that I'm in and, and question, uh, yeah, what am I doing here? Do I belong here? Um, and that was a really big thing on my way to do the research that I did when I was at Harvard. Just like God, like, <laughs> this is a fluke. I did not, I don't know how I got here. You know, there's so many people who could do this better than I could just from my own institution, not to say like across the country. Yeah. To hear that his word will not return to him void. Like what he spoke to happen, that you're going to Harvard, that you're going to med school, that you're in this position where you are, it's not going to return to him void. You may be a knucklehead, you may mess up, you may not be whatever, but whatever he spoke and you being there, whatever it was supposed to do is going to do. And so that was like really, that was really calming to me, reaffirmed in that, that, you know, you are who you are and you're in the space that you're in with all that you are, with all your gifts and with all of your challenges, but whatever you're in that space for is going to be accomplished. So yeah, that's that's definitely one of my favorite quotes versus, and then there's just an, another short quote that a friend of mine okay. says often that really, she says, at the end of the day, it's the end of the day. <laughs> I like Why am that. I sitting here worrying, tripping? At the end of the day, it's the end of the day. What can be said? What can be done? So yeah, I think between those two, those. <laughs> I have never heard yeah. that one, but I love it. I love it. Whew. Okay. Um, I also want to say, you know, you know, I know not everyone has this relationship with God, but some people do, the Holy Spirit, and whatnot. Um, where you'd be glad that He talks to you, but then also you'd be a little irritated. <laughs> Yes. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, like I was saying earlier, I was on a little hiatus. I was a little confused about what I was going to do with my podcast. And, you know, God gave this to me to do. And people who've been listening to what I'll know that whole story. I'll save it for another time. But the long and short of it was um, when you were talking about that, when you read that quote, then you're talking about that quote. I was like, all right, God, I know. You said 365, and I could take a hiatus for as long as I want, but it's going to be 365, because your word will not return to you, boy. <laughs> boy. You there. The podcast is there. It's like, going to do you know, what you I'm called it to do. It, but also, I'm like, I uh, know. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I appreciate you laughing with me on that one. <laughs> so, um, what is a moment, conversation, or event that either changed the trajectory of your life or had a significant impact on your life? Mm. Coming to to visit Loma Linda, this space, I uh, came to visit here, had actually no interest in coming here. <laughs> so this is a, uh, a religious med school. And Having grown up, I went to the private school that I went to. It was a um, religious Christian private school. Mm -hmm. And just growing mm -hmm. up in that space, I, I learned that racism, racism is going to be what it's going to be. But there's just a different type of racism that comes with Christianity. Um, Ooh, do tell. <laughs> yeah, I think that there is just a, a different lack of responsibility and accountability that white Christians have when it comes to their responsibility to their fellow man. I think oftentimes it, it becomes a conversation of, oh, you know, this is a sinful world that we live in. There's nothing that's going to change or nothing that I'm going to do to change what happens here. Kind of, it's sad that it's this way, but, you know, we got to wait till God comes to really, you know, to fix all that's wrong. A lot of white Christians, not least say, let me not say all, but I think in the space that I grew up in, it was really, that is not our problem. That is not our focus. 
why are we yes. dealing with these issues? Um, yes. And so, yeah, having that mindset and growing up in that mind frame of hearing that from them, it was like, I will never, like, I'm cool with my faith, with God. I'm cool with where we are. But I yeah. didn't want to subject myself to being at another institution. And so knowing about this school, I was like, yeah, I, that is not even on my list. And they had a special relationship with my undergrad where they would come and they would interview us and they would kind of do a pipeline system. And I was like, if I apply and this is the only place I get into, I'm going a, I'm to a take a gap year and reapply to other <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not trying to be here. I'm not trying uh-huh. to be here. And so I was coming out to California to visit another med school, UCLA. My cousin was graduating from there. Okay. And my parents were like, you know, while we're out here, we might as well take a tour of Loma Linda. I know we all collectively as a family are not feeling it, but we're out here. So we might as well. Yeah. Um, and so we drove out to here to Loma Linda. And as we pulled up on the campus, it was raining that day. As we pulled up to the campus, the clouds parted. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I know that you're lying, God. Like, I do not want <laughs> to be here. I do not want to be here. And so, you know, they're giving us a tour around the campus and me and my parents sitting in the back of the little cart, just nose uh-huh. turned up, rolling our eyes. And so they actually arranged for a, a, a dinner with a faculty, a black faculty that's here. Um, and just the life that that man poured into me, just speaking as far as like, you have to understand wherever you go, you will be valued as, as a black man in medicine, but even more so someone who has a Christian perspective, like to really be able to engage with the community and that perspective and the issues that we have with the history that we have in medicine, just the, yeah. the distrust and, and hurt that medicine has continually done with us to be able to be the bridge for that. Mm. to restore and help in that you will be wanted anywhere yes um, but you want to be in a place where they value you um Mm. you know there's a lot of places that will throw money at you there's a lot of places that will want you but you want to be where you feel fed and where you feel nurtured and so he was saying you know Loma Linda can be that place for you um I personally can speak to that but I just want you from now on when you're looking Mm -hmm. you want to end up for school in your career look for Mm -hmm. places where you know you will be nurtured and supported because they're gonna want you regardless Mm -hmm. that really changed how I was looking at because I think when you're applying into medicine it's like oh goodness like wherever will take me I have my nose turned up at Loma Linda but outside of that like I was like oh wherever I end up like anyone who will accept me you know you know yeah um but to really transition that mindset like I I have value in just my lived experience, in the way that I'm able to connect with a community that so desperately needs to be reached, the way that I'm able to do that in a way that my my colleagues aren't able to, there's so much value in that. And once you realize that value, you go to places that you know will support you in that, will treat you right and not take your gifts for granted. And that was just a huge shift in mindset for me. So- Sounds like it was both the event of going to Loma Linda, but Also, what I'm really hearing in particular is the conversation Mm -hmm. with this professor, Mm -hmm. like the combination of the two, right? And trust me, I totally know what you mean about, and then the sun, you know, it was rainy and then, and you're like, okay, okay. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, just disheartening, disheartening. Right. (laughs) I said, you know, Um, the one place I didn't want to (laughs) go. Right. And it's almost like, come on, come on. You got a real sense of humor, huh? (laughs) But the thing that I I think is so enriching to hear is what he shared with you about you're going to be wanted. Go someplace where you are nurtured. That we often are, are chasing after the thing that is the apex versus where will we actually be, as he said, nurtured and fed and supported. What you're saying just really resonates with me personally. Wow. What would that be like to choose a place not based on its prestige or what it offers you in terms of the material or whatever, but really to be at a place where your soul is nurtured. Mm -hmm. And I I think that's something that is missing, not just for African-Americans either. And perhaps 
what we're referring to as the great resignation and all of this stuff going on, I think a lot of that is this shift where as a society, many of us are going, well, wait a second, <laughs> how do I feel when I'm here? You know, mm-hmm. and, and, and kudos to those people who walked out of Twitter because they were like, this ain't it. Just going to leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, hundreds. So what is a moment or event that highlights your experience, Joseph, as a Black man? in the United States. Yeah, there's definitely been some moments where I've been proud. Um, I got to go to the first inauguration of of Barack Obama. I think I was wow. 10 years old. I was 10, I was 10 Nice, nice. Um, and that was amazing. I think actually centering around the events with Trayvon Martin and the teenagers that were killed, um, Publicly, I mean, this has been going yeah. on forever, but just publicly yes. for, for the whole world to see it. That was very validating for me. In my early years, I felt by my non-black peers, I felt really gaslighted when it mm. came to like, bro, why are you not? <laughs> why do you feel like you have to do X, Y, and Z? And like, why do you feel like you'll get in trouble for such and such? And like, why are you, you know, why do you feel like you're going to get in trouble or you can't be like the rest of us. And yeah, just for the for the world to see, like there is such a different expectation for us. The world does not see me like it sees you. And I think that was validating for me in that, yes, I have lived my life with these expectations and trying to achieve and trying to do. And there's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. And I think of course, within the Black community, that was well understood. But I think a lot of my non-Black friends, that was never something they really comprehended until recent years. Like, oh, Joseph, Joseph needs to do this. Joseph should go here. There is a different narrative that he's telling. There, there are things that he's breaking, cycles that he's breaking, things that he are, he's doing that are changing what the national narrative is. Yeah, and I think that was unfortunate that a lot of people my age didn't understand that. A lot of non-Black people my age didn't understand that. Yeah, I think it was validating for me for that to be on a world stage. That's something that they couldn't dismiss or not know about. As happened to so many African-Americans after the George Floyd incident, there was this wake up where all of a sudden there were lots of white people in particular, but non-Black people generally who understood, saw the difference and, and it like hit home in a way that it hadn't managed to hit home before. And so there are lots of um, folks who reached out to me and reached out to other Black friends that I know just to say, oh, I had no idea or, you know, oh, how are you? Like, that was a big thing. How are you? Anyway, a friend tells me, and she's a lawyer, she tells me that her best friend is an African-American woman. Mm -hmm. And this friend had been telling her about this difference in treatment for years. And she was able to say, tell me, confide to me, I don't know, that she never really believed it. Mm. She, She could not fathom that the difference that her best friend was telling her was so in the world of criminality and criminal justice. She couldn't believe it. Could not have Even though it was her best friend, but mm-hmm. it was too fantastical. And so I just needed to add that and share that with your peer group, how they couldn't get it. And I just want you to know they're grown folk <laughs> that also couldn't get it. So I appreciate that as a moment that highlights your experience as a Black man. And, and it might sound a little odd to someone to, to say that the loss of life in such tragic ways was somehow an affirmation, but it is in the sense that it gave other people insight and that insight is affirming. Yes. Yeah. Well, that brings me to the next question. It's kind of the signature question of the podcast. If the United States was a woman, what would you say to her? Mm. (laughs) And I really wrestled with this question. I was I was getting upset just trying to come up with that. <laughs> you say, look, you I'm say whatever. The response. Envisioning the United States as a woman, I would say to her, remember, remember where you came from. 
remember where you came from and who you came from. As a country, the United States tries to dress itself in equality, tries to dress itself in justice to say, you know, all, you know, here we are, we're this great democratic country. Yeah, and I'm like, if you, if you really truly acknowledge and gave credence to everything that went into this country, everything that was stolen, everything that was abused, if you truly gave credence to and tried to rectify everything that went into the history of making this country, you wouldn't have to try to dress up being just. You would be a just country. You wouldn't have to try to dress up and be in an, an equal country or an equitable country. You could actually be that. Uh, if it was a woman, I would say to her, you know, stop trying to dress in justice, put on a dress that says justice or dress. If you really remembered where you came from and gave credence to that and spoke to that and tried to right your wrongs, you could be justice without trying to powder it on or make up it on. Mm -hmm. Dress in that. You could actually be it. Hey. Okay. <laughs> uh, what is what is a moment event or an experience that for you highlights the experience of love what that feels like to me is is a journey of developing a mindset or like a heart posture around someone when it comes to just acting in their best interest even if it's contrary to what you're feeling for that person in the moment. Okay, give um, me an example of that. Yeah. Um, I feel this often, but I think a really an encapsulation of this is a a reel or a, a story that I saw recently on Facebook. It was um a skit of this couple who's mad at each other and they're both sitting on the couch. And it was like when you're when you're beefing with your spouse but you still love them. And uh, you know they're sitting back to back. And the guy pulls out these snacks and he, you know, side eyes his wife, but he, you know, <laughs> lends the tray over to let her pick some. And, you know, the wife picks up a water bottle and, you know, she's trying to open it. And the husband reaches over and he like opens it for her <laughs> and she passes the water back so he can have a sip. And it's like you could tell that they're very upset with each other, but they're still meeting each other's needs. They're still they still have a heart posture where it's like, I'm I'm mad at you, but I'm still going to act in your best interest. And I think that is love to me, especially in those deepest relationships and really long time friendships and parent to child and intimate relationships. That is love. And I think getting to a space where you're aware of that, where you know somebody so well, <laughs> that they don't have to tell you what they need. You know that about them. They don't have to tell you what their potential is or what the future looks like for them. You can foresee that for them. And you're going to act in the interest of what they need and act in the interest of where they're going in the future without them having to ask you or tell you. That's very clear. Yep. I was just in a tiff with this person I'm about to meet with. We had a major tiff. And um, then I got sick and it still came through the text We because we're not speaking. But how are you feeling today? I'm feeling okay. <laughs> it's love. We beat right. it, but it's still love. <laughs> it's still love, you know? Yeah. Oh, man. What is a moment in your life hmm. that for you exemplifies the feeling of being powerful, of having power or being powerful? I think that's come in a lot of different ways. Yeah, I think in this space where I am now, it's been a lot of realizing that there's power in speaking from the perspective that you have. Yeah, kind of going along with this, this thing that I've been learning about spoken word and presenting. There's power in, the, in, in kind of what you say um, and how you say it, but there's also power in who it comes from. To be somebody who doesn't know me and to hear me say something is like, wow, well, you know, what was said, how it was said was cool. But I think definitely for me, being kind of the oldest, in that, you know, I'm I'm the youngest, but I have nieces and nephews who mm -hmm. are younger than me and have kind of seen my journey and have heard my speeches and things. It's had a much bigger impact on them than I thought it would. How um, so? Yeah, just hearing them like quote things that I've said in some of my speeches to me oh. or um, 
Yeah, just not not realizing how big of an impact you have on somebody who's mm-hmm. watching and not knowing that people are even watching you like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it's one thing to hear a speech, but it's, it's another thing to see a speech and like see me, you know, I've, there's been times when I've taken time out to, you know, out of my studying or whatever to like come to my niece and nephew's events or to like mm-hmm. play with them or I spending summers with them. And it's like, you know, you have so much power in in who you are and how you treat people on a day-to-day basis. And I think that's true to everyone. And I think as a Black man, that really puts you in a unique space when there is such a, a need, such a need, such a hunger for Black role models, Black male role models. And yeah, to, to realize what a great power you have on people who are coming up after you that you don't realize. And that's something that is, yeah, it's like, you know, in these things that I'm doing, like, I want to be great in the health field. I want to be able to deal with health disparities. And that is something that I will do um, Mm -hmm. in in the process of working to do. Um, I want to be a great orator. You know, that's something I am actively working on. But just to realize in your everyday life and how you treat people and, um, and what you're going to achieve and how you share that with the younger generation, that is power, that is influence, that is something you live in. It's not a, an instantaneous thing that you do. It's an everyday thing that you live in and grow in and share and teach. And that is power. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And there's no necessarily pay title or, or degree that comes with that. That is an influence that you have every day and is powerful. I love that because it's so simple. It's, I'm going to cliche it, but mm-hmm. let your light shine. I see. That it's like you shine in, oh, no matter what you do. So what, what kind of light are you putting out there? Mm-hmm. And that that is our power, that we're making a difference every interaction we have. Mm-hmm. And whether we're aware of the difference that we're making and the impact that we're having on people, rest assured there's an impact you're having. And to own that as power, we don't often hear those uh, equated. We hear it as an opportunity. We hear it as compassion. We hear it as kindness. We hear it as empowering. But to hear it as take off the M and the ing and just to hear it as power Mm-hmm. That is, I, we don't go through our day. I don't go through my day going, huh, I'm just being powerful. I'm just, you know, I'm talking <laughs> to this person and this is my power. I've just made that person stay and this is my power. Mm-hmm. And I, I love the context in which you said that. So thank you. The last one I ask, and I always ask this is, mm-hmm. you know, Joseph, what did you get for yourself out of participating? in this conversation. Whew. Yeah, no, this was feeling valued. Yeah, I think <laughs> <laughs> oftentimes in the spaces that I'm in getting to present and speak, I get to speak from a polished place of like, this is what I'm going to say, boo, 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 boo. And you don't get a lot. Yeah, you don't get to hear a lot of me, a lot of my story, a lot of where I'm coming from when I say this. And yeah, I think even just to get to preface this, like, yeah, that I, I am someone who struggles a lot with like self-doubt and, and questioning and wondering, I think to be able to speak to my experience and speak through my story and speak through my accomplishments, mm-hmm. these are the things that I've accomplished, but like, you know, every step of the way I've questioned and wondered, like, do I belong in this? Am I able to do this? And to be able to speak in that and let both of those things exist this mm. is what I've done. This is how I felt, and this is kind of how it's led to my story. Mm. Uh, I have. I, this has been great to be able to speak to that, and I'm so thankful to be invited on this podcast. Well, thank you. Um, I'm always left with that impression. Um, there are always a few words that stand out about the the guest that that person that I've interacted with for over an hour. And as you were talking, especially in that last question about power. I really got how I see you, which is aligned, authentic, and self-aware. 
and it, and it's so funny because I had those words in my mind before you answered the question about what did you get and it, and it's what you said that you got was exactly that because you know you're having your authentic experience and you're being authentic about the self doubt and the questioning and the you know feeling like you were gaslighted at times as a young person you know what whatever their intention you're just authentic you're just very unfiltered not un because of your skill with oration and just who you are and, and what you accomplished in life, you know, you're not babbling, but it's, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like mm-hmm. sometimes people think if you're authentic, then it's got to sound kind of raw or something like that. And it's like, no, there's nothing raw in your speaking, but it is so from the heart. And so you have yourself be fully available. And one reason for that is because you um, possess a great deal of self-awareness mm-hmm. and that level of self-awareness, oh my gosh, if you could just bottle that up and and pass it around because it, it's something that a lot of people haven't had time or taken the time to really get to know their own experience mm-hmm. and um, to take the time to know and own your own experience, that too is a gift that mm-hmm. you give to others. Just that you know that that's a thing that can be. And I'm still in process, still in process. 100%. Right. And you will be until that last breath. <laughs> May that last <laughs> breath be decades and decades and decades away. Thank you for listening to 365 Brothers. I certainly hope you enjoyed the episode. I encourage you to subscribe. Please leave a review. I want to know what you think. Also, if you know someone who would be a fantastic guest for 365 Brothers, please direct them to our website, 365brothers.com. You'll also find all the episodes there, 365brothers.com. And your support is welcome. And remember, to listen is to love. Please direct them to our website, 365brothers.com. You'll also find all the episodes there, 365brothers.com. And your support is welcome. And remember, to listen is to love.